Good evening uh, and uh, welcome to our lecture tonight on pandemics. I am Professor Hugh Stevens. I'm on the board of the World Affairs Council of Western North Carolina and it gives me great pleasure to present this uh, opening remarks for this program. I think you're all familiar with globalism, which designates the vast increase in the number and variety and speed of interactions and exchange among humans and their products and ideas on such a scale that something called effective distance has been drastically reduced to the point that most people in the world are indeed highly interdependent and in some ways vulnerable to one another. One of its products is the rapid and extensive spread of severe diseases across large sections of our population in the world. This is not new, of course. The world hist our world history is repeat with plagues such as the Black Death, of the 13th century and numerous outbreaks of smallpox and even the 1918-20 influenza epidemic. Despite improvements in uh, medicines and treatment, the threat of pandemics, that is global outbreaks of serious illness, is still, still very much with us. It poses serious problems to the viability of entire societies and to the governments of even the most wealthy, stable countries in the world. You might remember that three years ago, 2003, that China was severely embarrassed when it attempted to hide the fact that it had uh, cases of SARS. And it's only after these people got out of China and began to die that the Chinese had to admit that something was wrong. Uh, during the past century, we've had I influenza epidemics about every 30 years. The last was the outbreak of the Hong Kong flu, I think about 1978, if I'm correct, which killed about 25,000 people in this country. Uh, unless you confine your mass media participation to all my children, Major League Baseball or the Wheel of Fortune, you are aware that pandemics, specifically avian or bird flu, is presently of acute concern to governments and their health authorities. One of the effects of this is quite interesting. It has expanded our concept of what's involved in national security beyond the military and economic power of a country. Consequently, medical treatment of personnel and facilities, and especially our public health system, and even our agricultural services have been thrust into the front lines of national defense and security. Now, epidemiology is an extremely arduous task, even in the better governed, stable countries of the world. It involves a constant search for vaccines and a struggle for better medical care and advances in hospitals. Good surveillance requires that medical, private med medical practitioners and local government agencies remain vigilant for outbreaks and that communications among health care providers, both human, for both humans and animals, is good enough to quickly mobilize efforts to contain outbreaks of disease. The, the effort is pursued at the world, the national, state, and the local levels. This includes the CDC, the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Disease, and the Food Safety and Inspection Service, the North Carolina Departments of Health and Agriculture, and county and city health departments. I should not omit the regional public health bioterrorism responsible team of we response team of Western North Carolina either. Tonight, we're fortunate to hear one of those who is at the forefront of the epidemiology effort in this state, Dr. Christina Simonson. Dr. Simonson is both a medical epidemiologist with the General Communicable Disease Control Branch, and this is all kind of like Chinese for me, but 
of the North Carolina Division of Public Health. She is board certified in pediatrics. She received her undergraduate and medical degrees at the university in the southern part of heaven, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and did her residency and chief residency at the Brody School of Medicine, East Carolina University. After serving a year on the faculty of the Department of Pediatrics at Eastern Carolina, she returned to Chapel Hill and got a master's degree in public health. Dr. Simeonson joined the North Carolina Division of Public Health in May of 2003. Her areas of interest include influenza, pandemic influenza, infectious disease in children, and vaccine preventable diseases. Dr. Simeonson, welcome. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thanks. It's a, a real honor to come up here and speak to the Western North Carolina World Affairs Council. Um, I've given quite a few talks on pandemic influenza and I try to change them every time. So I drive people in my office crazy because I probably, you've been to lectures where you can tell people haven't changed their slides in five years. And so I really tried to change it. And when I was told I had an hour, I, I tried, I might've tried to include too much. So um, I'm really gonna uh, talk about several different things, but if it's looking like you guys are interested in something else or, you know, we're kind of running out of time, I definitely want to have time for questions. So I will make sure that we have that. And this is just the overview to kind of tell you where we're going, because I always hated in medical school sitting through lectures, knowing that it was going to be about 45 minutes, but not knowing what we were going to cover, because I kind of like to know when we're at the halfway point. Um, so this is just a quick overview um, of what we're going to be talking about. And I do want to emphasize that anytime I talk about pandemic influenza, I want to make sure people understand what regular influenza is, our flu seasons every year. Um, here in North Carolina during the winter time. And then I want to talk distinctly about bird flu or avian influenza, which is what we've heard in the news so much about. And then take that leap and tell you then what is pandemic influenza, because they're really confused, I think, a lot in the media. And you hear bird flu and you think, are we right on the edge of a pandemic? So I wanted to go through those three. So bear with me in the beginning. Um, I, I'm going to try to keep it very low tech. I know we're all scared now with multiple computers up here, but it will be low tech and then I want to take a little time to sort of give you the background behind what we've heard on CNN in the last uh, six to nine months all of this talk about bird flu and outbreaks give you some background into are we on the verge of a pandemic so sort of assess what's going on with that and then we'll end with talking about some preparedness efforts mostly what we're doing in North Carolina because that's what I know about but I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on at the federal level as well so I promise this is the worst slide of the whole talk, okay? So just hang with me on this one and then we're gonna do great. Um, so this is the requisite, you gotta have one slide of the virus if you're gonna talk about a virus. And the main thing you need to know about influenza, there are several different types. Um, and the one that we're really interested in tonight and when we talk about pandemics and when we talk about birds is type A. So you can go ahead and forget the other two, okay? Um, when we're talking about pandemics, we're talking about type A influenza. And type A is unique because it can infect a lot of different species. So not just people, but it can infect birds. Um, I'll show you a slide of some of the other animals and you'll be fascinated what all it can infect. Um, but it's also unique in that it's further categorized into subtypes, okay? And I know you've seen this already, but you probably, if you've heard about it, you keep hearing about H5N1, right? You guys have heard about that in the news. The H and the N, all you need to know is that has to do with the proteins that are on the surface of the virus. So that's why I have this diagram here that looks kind of like a koosh ball. But basically the H and the N are um, abbreviations for the long words hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Um, so I get a raise every time I say those words. But you don't need to remember them. But basically H and N, um, I'll show you why this becomes very important when we start talking about birds and people and so on and so forth. But they're just proteins that stick out of the virus and the people who look under their microscopes all day can actually subtype them based on what these things look like. I cannot, but there are people that can. 
So when we're talking about influenza and why we could get into a pandemic, which is a worldwide global epidemic, so a world event going on, why influenza and not measles or some other type of disease? The main things you need to know are it mutates a lot and it mutates almost every year. And so that's why you can't just get one flu shot when you're 12 and be done with it. Every year your doctors are calling you saying, hey, come in and get your flu shot. And you wanna say, haven't you guys gotten any smarter since last year? Can't you just get one vaccine? It mutates almost every year. When it has a major mutation, then we're talking about pandemics. And I'll tell you about that in the upcoming slides, but it mutates a lot. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it can reassort. And what that means is it's genetic material can swap with other viruses of flu. So if you have a person who has regular old garden flu and they happen to get infected with a bird flu, those viruses in that person can swap pieces out. It's almost like Legos. And so that's what makes it really interesting because it already is mutating a lot and then it can swap pieces of its genetic material, which a lot of viruses cannot do. And then the final reason that we look at influenza and worry about pandemics is it infects a variety of different species. So you have a, a huge pool of viruses in a lot of different animals. So that swapping exchange can happen between a lot of different animals and on a lot of different occasions. So that's why flu is of such interest when we talk about pandemics. So let's talk about the different categories now. I've already kind of told you about types and said, let's just focus on A, but I wanna walk you through how is human flu different from bird flu and how does that get us to a pandemic? So I think we're all probably pretty familiar with regular old garden flu. Um, my daughter just had it last year um, in late late May, no, late March or early April. So I, I had experienced it a couple of years earlier um, and I hadn't had it in a long time. And I think we all are familiar with it that, you know, you feel like you've just been hit by a truck, high fever, your muscles ache. Um, and in the winter time, we do see this seasonal pattern where it, it comes usually in January or February, about six weeks of serious flu activity. Um, easily spread, like you can see in this picture, um, by respiratory droplets, which means all it takes is somebody coughing or sneezing and then another person getting those little droplets in their eyes or their nose. That's how you can catch the virus. So it spreads quite easily um, just person to person. And the thing to point out about flu, which I think gets um, lost a lot of times, we talk about pandemics and how big they're gonna be, but garden variety flu, our human flus, have a huge impact in the United States every year. About 36,000 people die from flu or its complications and over 200,000 hospitalizations. So really, um, in terms of people that, that study influenza, um, a lot of them get a little bent out of shape because some people only are interested when we're talking about pandemics. But regular flu is a very serious illness that we're constantly working in public health to get more people vaccinated and try to prevent this illness. So I know I promised that first slide was the only bad one, but this is just to show you, cause I'm gonna, the next segment on talking about the bird flus is where you're gonna understand where we get into trouble when we talk about pandemics. But this is just to show you human flus. So the ones that we see every winter, when we're talking about type A flus, there are only three different type of H's that can be sticking out of the surface and only two different types of N proteins. And it's a lot like a Chinese uh, restaurant menu where you pick one from column A and one from column B. So every subtype has one H and one N. And so when you're talking about humans, you only have three choices for your H and only two choices for your N. And I've just listed a couple of the more common subtypes here, but H3N2 and H1N1 are the two that have really been around for the last 25 years or so. So let's talk about the avian influenza now. Again, always a type A. And avian influenza, um, the natural reservoir, and what that means is the animals that really carry all these different viruses are these migrating birds. So your waterfowl, like your geese that fly in, your water um, migrating ducks, those are the natural reservoir, and they don't get sick with this virus. And that's very important for how it's spread because dead birds can't fly, right? So if this virus killed all of them, we wouldn't have a problem. We'd just have a pile of dead ducks in China and everybody'd say, okay. But these, these, these birds carry it in their intestines 
and they're not sick. So they're not flying in kind of sideways and not feeling well. They're, they're just doing their business feeling great. And so they're, you know, migrating around the world during their, their breeding season, so on and so forth. And they shed the virus in their intestines. And that's another key thing. Okay. So they're carrying it around and they're not sick and they're shedding it in their feces, which means when they land on that beautiful lake and everybody, oh, isn't that beautiful? Um, and then they get out and do their business on the side of the lake. If you have chickens that are then coming out there and eating and pecking and doing their thing, um, they, can, they can get it, you know, the fecal material or the poop all over their legs and then they're spreading it to themselves. So it's not like a migrating goose has to go up and cough on a chicken, right? They can just poop and then fly off and the virus is there, okay? So they don't get sick and they spread it in their feces. So it's kind of like a daycare gone wild kind of situation. I mean, it really can spread like wildfire. So very important in terms of why this is a big problem. And this is the last technical slide, I absolutely promise. But the main thing to notice is the list suddenly just got a lot longer, okay? The human flus, H1 through H3. We're talking about avian flus, H1 through H16. So think about your Chinese restaurant. You got 16 choices out of column A, nine choices out of column B. So you start to realize when we talk about these emerging viruses or a new virus, this is where we get it, okay? Humans, we've only got the H1, H2, and H3. Any other H protein sticking out of the surface that could infect us, we're not going to have any protection from because we've never seen it before. So this is just to show you that that's why we're talking about a novel virus or something new coming out that we don't have immunity to. And we've talked about um, migrating birds being the natural reservoir, but avian influenza and poultry is a huge problem. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. But in, in chickens and turkeys and um, domesticated ducks, it really can cause a severe illness. Um, it's, it can spread very easily from chicken to chicken. Um, these are cases where some of our partners in agriculture say that They'll have a few chickens in the, in the house that are not feeling well or seem to be not doing well, or a few of them have died overnight. And by the afternoon, half of this house of thousands of chickens can be dead. So it can spread very quickly and cause severe illness. And these pictures here, um, the one on the far left is sort of a, a lesser virulent or not as severe bird flu. It's kind of giving this bird some um, pink eye and some probably runny nose or runny beak, I guess. Um, but the other two pictures, the one right in the middle is a chicken you're looking dead on. The, the main thing to take away is that um, the combs and the wattles, okay, I did pediatrics, so I didn't know what these things were until I started doing all these things with flu, but basically the piece on the top of the chicken's head and the wattles that hang down get really filled with blood, and kind of hemorrhagic, and um, this is sort of representative of what's going on inside the chicken's body too, so I don't know if you guys can see that or not. I don't know if we have a, yeah, see the these are the waddles right here. They're just, normally they're real loose and flappy and they're really filling up and they're tight. And then that final picture isn't really showing up well at all, but basically it's showing two different chickens. One sort of still has a healthy comb and the others is very dark and purple. Um, and these are the findings. I mean, it's a, it's a real serious illness. It's very obvious for the farmers to be able to see this when it's in its virulent form. And when we talk about avian influenza getting into poultry, it becomes an issue because then they can spread it to other animals, obviously to people, which we've seen. And then they can also spread it to swine, pigs. Um, so this is a big issue because it, then they can continue to spread it, not just to one another, but to people and to pigs, importantly. So an important message to realize is that avian influenza usually don't infect humans. According to the news, it seems like it's happening every day and it's a, it's a major event. But when you really think about the number of avian influenza or bird flu viruses that are out there and the number of um, chickens that could be ill at a certain time and then the number of people that interact with them, it really is still a very rare event. So it's important to realize, even though we're, we're hearing about cases every week, um, it's, it's pretty uncommon. When you do see it in people, it is a wide variety of what you can expect. I mean, we're hearing worst case scenarios out of Southeast Asia and now in Eurasia, but it can be a very mild illness like a pink eye type thing, a flu-like illness like we would have with regular flu, or it can be real severe pneumonias and that type of thing, so a wide range. And the important thing to realize is that avian influenza does not mean pandemic flu, so if we have avian influenza occurring in people, that does not 
absolutely mean that we're on the verge of a pandemic or one is coming within six months or next year. Um, it's just several things have to still happen beyond this, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, this is, this is to show that point to you because I think in the last 12 months, 9 to 12 months, it's everything has been bird flu, bird flu, and they're talking about this H5N1, which on this map is all of the red circles showing you all the different countries that have had illnesses recently. But what's interesting to note um, is that the Netherlands had an H7 outbreak in 2003 where they had 89 cases of, of human bird flu infections. And does anybody here remember hearing about that in the news? Yeah. Okay, so usually people don't remember it. I don't even remember it. And I was had just started in public health. I think if this were to happen now, like if we were to hear about it in Europe, you know, this big outbreak of 90 cases um, in the current climate of being sort of uh, hyper aware of bird flu, everybody would be really panicked. This happened when we were dealing with SARS, and so it just kind of got missed. I mean, people didn't even notice it because we were seeing cases in Toronto of SARS and China and so on and so forth. So this, uh, it's just to illustrate that avian influenza in humans happen. It's not very often, but these outbreaks do happen. And this map is showing you different examples as far back as 97, 1997. So it can occur. So let's talk now about pandemic influenza because I've kind of told you about the garden variety, human flu. We talked about bird flu. So pandemics, according to the World Health Organization, occur when a new or novel virus, so again, anything above an H3, right, one of those different Hs, um, starts to infect humans and is easily spread from person to person. There won't be any immunity because it's going to be a new virus to us. And what can result is several simultaneous outbreaks happening across the world. And in order to get to this step, so I've told you avian influenza doesn't mean pandemic influenza. What does it take? The virus has to have another one of those um, mutations occur, either one of those swapping events I told you about where a pig or a person is going to be infected with both a human virus and a bird virus and the genes are going to switch around. That's one way, or an avian flu virus can continue to mutate and mutate and mutate and get to a point where it's easily spread from person to person. So that hasn't happened yet for H5N1. And the million dollar question is, is it gonna happen? And there's nobody that can tell you for certainty that it will. And the other question then is, if you think it could happen, when will it be? And that's another huge question that we have. So once this mutation happens, you're now back to a human flu virus, okay? So it won't matter now whether I was exposed to a chicken or not. I can get it from my neighbor or my daughter or whoever. It's a human flu virus that's spreading easily from person to person, but it's of avian origin. One of those H proteins on the surface is going to have come from a bird. And again, we're not going to have protective antibodies. So that's why there's so much push to try to get vaccine um, the far right-hand column is looking at the impact or the number of deaths um, in the United States during these three pandemics. And uh, by far, 1918 was the most notorious. We had about a half a million people die in the United States, most of them in about a six- to eight-week period. So pretty impressive in terms of the number of people that died in such a short amount of time. But the other two pandemics really weren't quite as, as notable, for, and that's good news. Um, but it makes you realize that as planners, we kind of have to plan for everything because this could end up being almost like a typical flu season, the 1968-69 flu season. Um, we had just around 34,000 deaths. And, you know, that's about what a typical year is for us. So a pandemic could come and not have a huge impact like Spanish flu, but we have to be prepared for worst case scenarios for obvious reasons. And this slide I really like to put in here, even though I'm not a real math person and I, I always hated graphs and things, but it really is uh, telling in that, you know, when I tell people a half a million people died in the United States in 1918, okay, well, how many people lived in the United States then? What does that really mean? This graph just tells you what it meant. And this is looking at infectious disease mortality in the 20th century, which means the number of people that died from infectious diseases. And what you'll notice is there's a nice 
drop pretty much from 1900 to 1980, 1990. But you see that huge spike, does everybody see that? That's where the mortality rate from infectious disease doubled, and that's 1918, Spanish flu. So it's the only infectious disease that has that dramatic of an impact over a whole century. Um, when we look at things like AIDS and tuberculosis and that kind of thing, those are big problems, um, but pan flu is the one thing that can really have such a sharp impact in a very short period of time. And this is just showing you kind of what some of the numbers are from the federal pandemic influenza plan. Again, this is what makes it so difficult as planners. This is sort of a mid-level pandemic. So this is not what we would expect if we had a repeat of Spanish flu, um, but sort of a mid-level pandemic. And you can see the numbers here, um, you know, up to 300,000 deaths in the United States. Obviously, if we have a more severe pandemic, the numbers may be higher than that. Um, if we have a more milder one, it may be like a typical flu season, maybe 36, 40,000 people die. Still a lot of people dying from something that we have a vaccine for during our regular seasons, but um, obviously when we're talking about pandemics, it's just a wide range of what we're, what we're up against. So now let's turn and sort of go through what we've seen in CNN and headline news and all that over the last six, nine months to try to put it into perspective. You know, are we right on the brink? Um, is the media just blowing this out of proportion? I've actually heard conspiracy theories like this is the government just dreaming this up kind of thing. So um, I, I don't agree with that, but I, I do want to kind of tell you based on what's happened sort of where we're at. So if you don't remember anything else about the beginning about we have seasonal flu and bird flu and pandemic flu and mutations and H's and N's. If you wanna walk out of here and, and explain it to somebody else, this slide is by far the most elegant. This is the one of the directors at the World Health Organization. Basically says you need three prerequisites to get yourself into a pandemic. You have to have a novel influenza virus emerge on the scene, a new HN that we haven't seen before, okay? So H5N1 has obviously something new. And then that novel virus has to be able to infect humans, okay? Even one case, you meet that second prerequisite, and we've done that with H5N1. The third and final elusive prerequisite, fortunately it's elusive, is this virus then has to be able to mutate so that it can easily spread from person to person. And that has not happened yet. So we've met these first two with quite a few of those. That map I showed you with all the little circles on it with H7 in Netherlands, there were some circles up in the British Columbia from 2003. These first two prerequisites do get met, okay, every so often, but this final prerequisite of it has to mutate and spread person to person is the, is the last, sort of like the top of the roller coaster and then you're on your way. Um, and this hasn't happened yet, and it really is the million dollar question. I think a lot of experts like going on TV and telling you it's gonna happen this year, because they wanna be the one to then get called by the Today Show and say, I told you, you know, it was me. Um, so I think the, the more humble influenza specialists who've been in this business for 30, 40 years are the ones that say, you know, I don't know. I, I really don't know. And, and I don't think it's a lack of intelligence, and I don't think it's people trying to hide that information. I think people really don't know, because flu viruses are very shifty, and they're very kind of erratic, and, and so this last piece is just the big black box. We have no idea. And for any of you who end up following along later, wanting to know where we're at, the World Health Organization is going to be in charge of the international sort of declaration. Um, so it's similar to kind of our homeland security levels of alert. Um, they have pandemic phases of alert, sort of what we all need to be doing. And it's nice because it kind of gives us a framework to say, okay, at this phase we need to be doing this and thinking this and um, so on and so forth. So right now we're at a phase three Basically what that means is we have a novel flu virus in people, but it's not spreading person to person. If they started to see cases where they really felt like it was trying and they had a few cases, um, secondary cases spreading person to person, they would upgrade to a phase four or phase five. And then phase six is gonna be your full blown pandemic, person to person spread, the chickens don't matter anymore, that kind of thing, okay. 
This is just to kind of give you the final, or not final, the most recent uh, case count. These are the cases of human H5N1 that have been reported to the World Health Organization since this latest outbreak started in late 2003. And um, when we started uh, this year, 2006, I was really hoping maybe things were going to quiet down. And we had about four or five countries reporting cases. Came into the office in January and uh, after the break, and Turkey starts reporting cases, and then Iraq, and then, you know, so on and so forth. So now we're up to nine cases listed here um, with cases and people. And it's pretty daunting numbers, um, 192 cases that have been laboratory confirmed. So that means it's not just the doctor thinking, I think you've got this funny kind of flu and I'm going to treat you for it or put you in the hospital. These are people that actually had their samples sent to World Health Organization. And of those 192, 109 have died. So that's, that's a pretty high fatality rate. It's kind of scary if you think about getting this, this um, certain type of flu. What I will say to you is two things. I don't think that H5N1 really is this severe of a disease. I think it's very severe. But I don't think 50% of the people that get it die. I think the numbers that are being confirmed to the World Health Organization are only the sickest people that are showing up at the hospital, having problems breathing, have pneumonia. I think there are asymptomatic and mild infections that are staying out on the farm and not coming in to get care. And so those studies are ongoing now with the CDC and World Health Organization, knocking door to door, drawing blood, asking questions, trying to figure out what really is the total number of cases. And I think this, this fatality rate is not going to be as high. The other good news is that for whatever reason, once that final prerequisite is met where it can spread person to person, usually these flu viruses then lose some of their virulence. So if they're really bad viruses that cause these kind of numbers, once they have that last mutation, it's almost like they have to give something up. So once they're easily spreading person to person, they're not quite as severe. So I say this to you now, I honestly believe if we get into a pandemic with H5N1, I don't think anywhere near half of the people that get it are going to die. I think we're looking at maybe one in a hundred, which is still pretty high when you think about it spreading among a lot of people. You can end up with a lot of cases and a lot of people in the hospital, but I don't think half of the people are going to die from it. So I think sometimes that's been said in the news media. I know I heard a congressman say it. He wasn't from North Carolina, but I don't remember <laughs> where he was from, but I just, I hit my forehead because I thought, oh no. So it, I, I say it to you now with all honesty, it, it will not be as bad as these numbers make it look. But I think these still are very telling in the sense that we'll talk a little bit about what these cases have looked like, but it, it is a very serious illness in, in this form, at least right now. So the biggest risk factor right now is direct contact with poultry, and I've listed some of the examples of, of what they've found from people, but these are people that don't necessarily own farms like we would in Duplin County here in North Carolina. These are people who live with their poultry like pets. Um, so th most of the cases, uh, over 75, 80% have either, you know, plucked and prepared dying chickens for dinner. These have been children who've played with chickens like they would their dog or their cat. In fact, one of the most heartbreaking cases to read about was an elementary school age girl who, as her chicken was dying, carried it around in a blanket like you would a baby doll and then buried it with all the formality and kissed it and so on and so forth and contracted the virus. So it's not enough just to travel to these countries and, you know, take a tour and, you know, maybe see a chicken across the street. This is really close, close contact with, with poultry that I just don't think we we really do that much of here or even when we travel. But obviously, um, surfaces can get contaminated again with fecal material or chicken poop. And so if you were to go um, to a live bird market in Thailand, for example, and put your hand down at a place where they had cages of chickens that were diseased and not wash your hands before you then went and ate or rubbed your eye, that is a way you could get it. But again, the vast majority of these cases have been very intimate direct contact. They sleep with their chickens, the chickens go in and out of the house, that kind of thing. Um, the bad news is that most of the cases, those 190 plus, have been young children and young healthy adults. So whereas our seasonal flu, our regular flu seasons, 
sort of seem to pick off the very young and the very old people with underlying health conditions. These tend to be healthy children and young adults. We don't think it's anything having to do with their immune systems or the way their bodies are made or that kind of thing. It really seems to be these are the people that are having that intense contact with the poultry. So it really gets back to that primary risk factor. And most of these cases have presented with fever, um, cough, and then problems breathing. So a pneumonia type picture. And this is not even going to show up very well, but this slide is good just because it sort of shows that where your lungs on an x-ray are normally supposed to be very black, you can kind of see through them. Um, these are big, white, fluffy spots, a very obvious pneumonia, what we'd like to call the third-year med student could have diagnosed it type thing. They wouldn't have had to call the radiologist. So these people all have very severe pneumonia that's usually very progressive, so not the kind of thing that your primary care doctor picks up on exam and says, oh, you might have walking pneumonia, or I'm not sure, but let's go ahead and treat you. These are, these are very obvious. They have very severe pneumonias. So there is good news um, in all of this. The good news is there has been no sustained person-to-person -person transmission. One of those humble influenza virologists I was telling you about has been quoted as saying, if H5N1 hasn't mutated yet, maybe it's not capable of it. Maybe there's something wrong with this virus that it's going to cause problems in people exposed to chickens, but it's never going to make that final leap. Um, I, I think that's still kind of up in the air, but that's a little piece of good news that we, we're still not dealing with a human-to-human -human virus. Um, we've had a few cases of limited spread within a family. They're still trying to tease out, well, maybe the aunt was exposed to chickens when she came to take care of the daughter or those types of things, but no, no sustained person-to-person -person where, a, you know, an individual got it and then three more people developed it having been exposed to that person. The other good news is that healthcare workers have not come down with it, that have taken care of these patients. And that's very different from SARS because SARS, one of the big risk factors was being a healthcare worker. So this has been um, good news. And these were healthcare workers that were caring for these patients a year and a half ago when we didn't really even know what we were dealing with. They weren't wearing masks, they weren't wearing gloves, they weren't wearing gowns, they were just going in and taking care of the patients. So not easily spread to healthcare workers and that's good news right now. The bad news is we've still got this virus in migrating birds and in poultry, and it's going to be very hard to get rid of it. There's just, it's, these countries that are having it are responding by killing flocks of chickens to prevent it from spreading, and it's still getting around. And a lot of the piece of that is those migrating birds, because they're not sick, and you, know, you can't test all of them, and they don't have passports, and you can't check them at the border. They're just going to keep going, going on and spreading it. So that's the bad news. have to check and see how all these are showing up. But this is basically the map showing where all the bird cases have been, both wild birds. So um, I was just talking to a gentleman out in the lobby who said that the UK is reporting um, H5N1 in a swan. So that hasn't been put on this map yet. But basically it's showing in the lighter orange color where we've had it in wild birds. And then the darker orange is poultry. And when this first started, this recent outbreak, most recent outbreak, it was mostly Southeast Asia. And as you can see, in the last six months, far westward spread. And we really feel like even if this isn't a pandemic, I think we're going to be dealing with avian influenza or bird flu in birds in North America at some point in the near future. I've heard, again, government people saying maybe even within the next six months. I'm not sure on that. I don't understand migratory flyways very well, but they obviously cross a lot up in the Alaska-Russia kind of border. Those breeding grounds are shared, so I think it's very likely that we're going to have H5N1 in a bird at some point in the near future. So the good news right now for the United States, we don't have H5N1 um, in migratory birds. We don't have it in poultry and we don't have it in people. We have tested some people here in North Carolina. We've had a couple travelers come back from countries that were experiencing outbreaks, had flu-like illness, had been kind of close to birds. I mean, it wasn't a great story, but we were worried enough. We said, let's go ahead and test you. All of them have come up positive for regular influenza because when you fly on a plane anywhere over around the world, you're exposed to flu viruses that way. So no um, novel influenza viruses or no H5N1. 
Um, I do want to also state that in the midst of all this hullabaloo about H5N1, it is quite possible that there will be bird flu in the United States from some other you know, avian influenza virus. And this slide's just showing you that in most recent 2004, our neighbors to the north in the Delmarva, the Maryland, Delaware, Virginia Peninsula, and also in Texas, had two different outbreaks in poultry. No human cases associated with it, but still a lot of chickens died um, from bird flu. So it's quite possible in the midst of all this focus on H5N1, a different bird flu is going to hit the newspaper for some other reason. So just realize that's a possibility too. So we're going to skip to uh, pandemic preparedness, and again, I'm going to mostly show you North Carolina stuff because that's what I'm most familiar with, but maybe in the question answer we can talk about other things that you guys have interest in. But this is just showing you um, for North Carolina, for our population of 8.5 million people, if we were looking at a mid-level pandemic, so something like the 1957 Asian flu, um, we could have about one, one and a half million outpatient visits for pandemic influenza. Um, 29,000 hospitalizations and around six, well, just under 7,000 deaths. In a typical year in North Carolina, we have about 1,000 deaths from flu. Um, they're not all reportable, just uh, pediatric cases, but we can look back on seasons and pull death certificates in around 1,000 North Carolinians each year. So a mid-level pandemic could be about five or six-fold higher um, for what we'd be looking at. And the, the important thing to note about these numbers, again, I look at this and I say, well, one and a half million visits, I mean, you know, how many doctors do we have? How many nurse practitioners can see people? But the key thing to realize is this is going to happen over about a six to eight week period. And this is on top of what's already going on. I mean, people are still going to have heart attacks, get in car accidents, have problems with diabetes. Um, kids are going to have ear infections. Women are going to go into labor. So it's, it's above and beyond, and it's in a very short time period. So that's when we look at these numbers, we really have to remind ourselves this isn't added on over six months or a year. This is in a very short amount of time. So the main goals when we talk about planning, we want to reduce morbidity and mortality. So is there any way to lower those numbers of deaths, lower the number of people that need to go to the hospital? Is there a way we can prevent people from even getting uh, infected and sick? So looking at those strategies. And then the third goal here is very important for pandemic influenza, and it's different from other things we plan for, in that if so many people are going to be infected, or taking care of people who are sick, we might have a big reduction in the workforce. And so this third goal of reducing this uh, social kind of chaos is very important and one that's very new to us in public health. We're kind of used to saying, okay, this vaccine and, and these pills and you know testing these people early and isolating them will cut down on the number of cases. But this, this whole concept of social disruption is new for us. So we've, we've found new friends in emergency management you know, because they respond to hurricanes <laughs> and asking them sort of to weigh in on a lot of these issues. So three main goals for pandemic flu. And I like to beat the drum a lot in my office. We're, we're under preparedness burnout now since bioterrorism has come to the forefront. Everybody has plans on everything and nobody wants to write a new plan on anything. But I really think that pandemic influenza is important to plan for separately. It, it can be done in conjunction with other planning for sure, but it, it, you have to have an extra element of planning because it's gonna be widespread. So North Carolina, we're really good at dealing with hurricanes. I know you guys had Hurricane Ivan <laughs> recently, so even in the mountains, you know about this. But this is not the kind of situation where all those utility workers are going to come driving in from Tennessee to help us. During a pandemic, it's quite likely that you know Tennessee and Virginia and South Carolina, et cetera, are all going to be experiencing it simultaneously. So we've got to dig deep and make plans within our communities to respond. Um, it's also going to be long duration. I mean, a hurricane. There's a lot of anticipation up to the point it hits, but really it's like an eight hour, 12 hour event and it, it kind of blows offshore and then we're dealing with um, sort of the cleanup and the needs assessment and this kind of thing. Pandemic flu is going to be six to eight weeks sustained, a lot of cases. So we really have to prepare for it being widespread and being for a long period of time. And so we need to plan for healthcare services 
Are they going to get overwhelmed? We think it's likely. Um, are we going to have shortages of medications and hospital beds and staff? Um, we think that's possible. So we've got a plan for these kind of things. And this is just to briefly show you that the good news is the reason I don't think it's a federal plot um, to draw our attention away from other things is that they've actually been planning for a while. Um, I, I won't say everybody in federal government, but a, a lot of hardworking people have been. And even as early as the 90s, they were doing plans. 1999, the CDC had a planning guide that states could use to develop their plans. Um, the big... Uh, media circus around the federal plan being released in November was actually a revision of a plan that was out the year before. So the plans have been in place for a while. Um, and they've got a lot of great resources on this new website, um, which I'll, I have at the end too, but it's pandemicflu.gov. And basically anything you would ever want to know, um, all the checklists for schools, for individuals and families, for businesses, um, healthcare providers. You can take one into your doctor and say, have you done this yet? You know, I've done mine and um, r really give them a good scare. That'll be fun. Um, anyway, it's a great website and yeah, I don't know how well this is going to show up, but this is a screenshot of it. When you get to it, this is what it will look like, and all those purple tabs along the top are th for the different groups or entities that need to plan. So www.pandemicflu, all run together, .gov, um, and it's all the plans are there. You can access your state plans, so um, there are links to all kinds of things through that. So what are we doing in North Carolina? Um, we, as well, have had a plan for a few years. We didn't just throw something together in October because of all the recent interest. Um, we've had a plan in place uh, since October of 2004, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the plan in the next few slides. But I do want to tell you we're also doing exercises, which is a, a new concept for me in public health. We never got to do exercises in residency. It was all, all work and no play. But public health, anytime you have a, a plan in place, you want to drill it. You know, you want to make sure, is this plan going to work? When I say I'm going to call this person and I'm going to order this and fill out, you know, these, these forms to get this equipment that I need, is that going to work? Um, we do a lot of exercises, and there are several different types, but there's this tabletop exercise, which is bringing everybody together in a room and going through a scenario and having people play different roles and say, okay, you're the public health nurse in Wilkes County. What are you going to do when you get this call? Okay, you're the health director, and the mayor of your town wants to shut the borders. What are you going to do? It's a nice way to get people to start thinking through the problem in different roles. So we just wrapped up eight weeks of that with our hospitals and local health departments um, in January and February of this year. And then the real exciting thing coming down the road is this statewide uh, full-scale exercise. And what that means is a couple of lucky hospitals across the state are going to actually have real people showing up at the door going, I have a fever and a cough, you know, and I've been exposed to chickens or now it's pandemic and I was exposed to somebody you diagnosed yesterday. So really starting to do these things where we're going to deliver things to health departments and figure out how they're going to, you know, distribute it throughout their counties. So those are, those are in the works, and I think we'll definitely be obviously revising plans based on what we learn. And then most recently um, for North Carolina, we've convened a, a pandemic influenza ethics task force um, because there are the big issues here that you don't want just a few people in government and their office going, well, I don't know, maybe we should do this. You know, you really want it to be well thought out. You want different people represented, different groups. So the Institute of Government is taking the lead and has formed a task force, which will meet for the first time next month, I think, to really talk about allocation of resources during an event like this. And we're, we're really looking forward to the product out of this group. So just briefly about our plan, um, again, we, we actually uh, completed the first version in October of 2004, just revised based on the federal plan update back in November. So we revised our plan and put it back out in January of this year. And um, I have to stand up here and tell you this was not all public health doing. Um, we had to work with a lot of different people. Again, that third goal of reducing social disruption, maintaining 
infrastructure and communities. We really had to work a lot with our partners in emergency management, uh, the hospital association, um, schools, medical societies, et cetera. So this was really a collaborative effort um, that I'm real pleased about because I think compared to a lot of states, we're ahead of the game in terms of the people that we've brought in to help, but there's still a lot of work to do with planning. And similar to the federal government's website, this is a screenshot of, of our plan, which is on the on the internet. Unfortunately, we don't have hard copies because it's changing. You know, every time the state health director calls and says, "Hey, did you read this article?" and we're going back in and <laughs> changing things here and there. So it's all web-based, and uh, that way people can really go in and pick out what they need to look at. Um, if you're an infection control practitioner in a hospital, you can go read that section. You don't have to worry about. Um, uh, what a press release would look like or that kind of thing. So this is just to show you what it looks like on the web. And these are the key chapters, which if you pretty much opened any plan, either the federal plan or this other state's plans, you're going to see these key things. But basically command and control is sort of who's in charge, um, how many people do they have under them, how are you going to communicate um, public health to emergency management, public health to the governor if it's widespread and can close to a state emergency? How are, you know, where are you going to be located and um, in conjunction with the emergency operations center at the state level, so on and so forth. So that's basically what's in that section. Surveillance is how we're going to detect cases in North Carolina. Um, the vaccine and antivirals we'll talk about more in a little bit, but basically it's how are we going to get these precious commodities here? Once we get them, how are we going to distribute them out to people? Um, medical surge is just that, um, preparing hospitals and healthcare providers for an increased number of cases. Um, preparedness in healthcare facilities is really getting down to how they're going to do triage, um, what infection control measures they're going to be able to do um, in their facilities. And then communication is not just how well we talk with one another in state government, which I can tell you definitely on a bad day needs some work, but um, also how we communicate with our providers. I mean, they're going to, you know, healthcare providers are going to want to know um, once cases are detected in the United States, what do they need to know for their patients? They're going to want information to give to their patients. So the communication chapter really deals with all of those issues, um, what kind of things we're going to be putting out as public service announcements, how we're going to be communicating with the public and that type of thing. As if that wasn't enough, then we have this whole section of appendices which support a lot of those chapters, but also we've got several other pieces. Just a few examples, legal authority looks at quarantine and isolation orders. Um, if we had a traveler who came in on a plane with a febrile illness, so they had fever and cough and they were really sick, um, and three other people on the flight over, let's say from France, also became ill, um, you know, could we quarantine that plane? What orders, what legal authority do we have? We've tried to flesh all that out so we're not running around at the last minute trying to find a judge at midnight to sign something, kind of have it laid out already in advance. So that's one example. And then we've just added a big piece on the psychosocial impact of pan flu, realizing that it's not all medical. A lot of the morbidity is going to be people if they have somebody hospitalized, if they have someone die, um, healthcare workers especially who are overworked and stressed out um, trying to meet their needs as well. So this is a exciting thing for us because many states have not included this in their plan. So we're real, real happy to have worked with our partners in mental health on getting this appendix done. And then the other piece that I'm real proud of is we have this local health department toolkit. I don't know how many of you, uh, actually Buncombe County Health Department is by far, I think, one of the best in the state, so big round of applause for them. But uh, in a lot of counties that are small, uh, really small, they've got one nurse who does everything. I mean, she's your tuberculosis nurse, she's your childhood immunization nurse, she goes out in the parking lot and checks the car seats, she helps people get WIC, she, you know, I mean, answers the phone <laughs> during lunch. I've worked at these health departments, They're, they can be pretty small with one person. So we really wanted to boil it down to what does a health department need to do to plan for this. We didn't want to make them read the federal plan, which is 400 pages. We didn't want them to have to read the state plan, which is about 85 pages. So we put together a toolkit of, look, on your lunch break, just make sure you're at least doing these 10 things and get it together. Um, so we've got some of the things for them specifically that really help them with their planning. 
So this is by far, I think, the most exciting part. So you've made it. We're well past halfway. And uh, this is kind of just sort of the, the latest ongoing issues in pandemic flu. Um, there are probably 100 at least, but I've picked some of the, the flashier ones, I guess. So we'll go through a few of these, and then we can do some question answer type things. So I think the biggest thing on everybody's mind is vaccine. All right, we have a seasonal flu vaccine every year. It comes usually on a good season in October. Um, so what about pandemic flu vaccine? I heard people laughing. I know this year it was not great, but pandemic flu vaccine, um, this picture I hope you can see. Well, not great, but basically it's an egg and somebody is illuminating it from the back with like a fancy flashlight. And up at the top, you can't see well, but somebody's injecting that egg with a long needle. That is the flu virus that's going to go in the vaccine and then the vaccine is going to grow in that egg for about three months so we're still with 1950s technology with how we make flu vaccine a lot of our other vaccines we're doing it in cells now and it's all fancy and quick but for whatever reason flu virus is lagging behind so this is why it takes so long to make vaccine because we actually grow it in eggs and isn't that ironic bird flu <laughs> vaccine grown in eggs and it actually was a problem when they first started they were killing a lot of the eggs I mean because it has to be fertilized I didn't tell you that fertilized hens eggs and so they were killing all of them and they were like oh whoops you know and had to modify the virus so they've gotten over that hurdle but it's still going to take months and that's the problem okay it's not the government's not given enough money to make vaccine or this kind of thing the technology is lagging way behind so they've made about two million doses of an h5 n1 vaccine it is stockpiled away um, but if a pandemic were to happen a phase six okay person to person spread ring the bell world health organization's letting us all know cnn will let us know from that moment they're going to want to take that virus and make vaccine because remember one of those first slides i showed you i'm really make going hard on you guys but one of the very first slides influenza viruses love to mutate so h5n1 that was around in 2003 is not the same as the one that's around in 2006 so you can't make 300 million vaccines of what's out there now because number one, H5N1 may not be the one that causes a pandemic. Number two, even if it is, it may mutate enough that that vaccine's not gonna be very effective. So it's what they're really trying to do is put a lot of money into research to make vaccines quicker. You know, Can we make them quicker in cell culture than growing them in eggs? So that's the big thing. Um, the other thing they've done, they've tested the most recent vaccine, and the good news is it's safe and it works. So the two million doses they have are producing good antibodies in the people they've studied, and it's safe. They're not having any problems or side effects. The bad news is it's taking two doses one month apart, and it's taking a higher dose than our regular flu vaccine. Okay, so normally we're making seasonal vaccine. It's taken us three to four months at least. Um, now they're telling us we're going to need two doses for every person in America, so that's 600 million doses, and it's going to be at a higher level, meaning we need to make more than what we're used to making. So one of the other research pieces is, is there anything we can attach on to the virus that will boost the immune response? We won't have to use as much. So that's where some of the other money is going. So don't be skeptical when you hear, okay, you know, millions and millions of dollars are being poured into research for flu vaccine. It's very important in terms of helping us get farther along to respond to pandemic flu. Antivirals is the other big question. Okay, so Tamiflu, right? Everybody says, well, I could just take Tamiflu, everything will be okay. Tamiflu is currently the one antiviral pill that you can take that might lessen the symptoms and complications from um, the current virus H5N1 that's causing problems. We've got these other antivirals, um, romantidine and amantadine, but for whatever reason, the flu viruses get very resistant to those very fast and they don't work. So those two are off the table. That leaves Tamiflu. There is another form in a similar class to Tamiflu, but it's inhaled. It's a dry powder and you can't use it in anybody that has underlying health problems. So people with asthma and diabetes and heart disease aren't going to be able to use it. So Tamiflu really is the best option because it's one pill twice a day um, for five days, maybe longer. Um, but the problem is there's only one company that makes it and they're located in Europe. And so this is a huge issue because we're trying to get some of the rights to manufacture it and put up plants in the United States. 
I think we're on the right track. I think if pandemic flu doesn't come for five or seven years, we're going to be in great shape. I think if it, if it comes this year or next year, we're not going to have enough Tamiflu. Um, so the the U.S. government is stockpiling it. That's the good news. Um, the bad news is they're nowhere near the goal that they want to reach. If you go to these national meetings and you raise your hand and ask about the stockpile, you always get this funny little deer in the headlight look. And like when you say, well, how much do we have now? And, and, and they're like, well, uh, we're, we're trying to get this much. And you're like, no, 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 how much now? Um, but basically they're trying to get a total of 81 million doses, which would be enough to treat a quarter of our population. And that seems to be the, the right amount to kind of take care of everybody who would really need it. Um, because not everybody's going to get this. Um, so 25% of the population will really make a big impact. So that's their goal. But right now they only have about 5 or 6 million doses. They're hoping by the end of this year to have that up to about 15 or 20. Um, and then every year beyond that more and more. Um, but this is one of those few times in life where even though these pills are very expensive, I don't think money's going to be the problem. I think it really is a production issue. And we're working on it. And I don't mean we, like I have anything to do with it. But... It's the government's on the right track with this, but again, I think it's the same with vaccines. If it hits this year or next year, it's not going to be pretty. If it comes five or seven years from now, I think we're going to be in really much better shape. Community containment is something that we focus on a lot at the state level in our planning because we can't do much about the vaccine issue. We can't do much about the antiviral issue. Um, I didn't tell you on the last slide, um, but we tried to stockpile here in North Carolina, as did many states. Um, we actually had some money left over um, last year, and we said, what could we use this for? And people were like, let's stockpile some Tamiflu. We'll, at least we'll have some. And we called the company, and we told them how much money we had, and we put in our order, and we were delivered six boxes as in one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have enough to treat the governor through <laughs> through an event, and that's about it. So I promise you we're not hoarding it up at the state. I'm not getting Tamiflu, and I helped write the plan. So um, it's it really is a, a federal issue right now. They are talking about states in the coming years matching funds to get more vaccine. We are on target to do that. So North Carolina, when that becomes available, is looking to have those funds ready. Um, but again, it's the production issue. So what we like to talk about at the state is what are the non-pharmaceutical countermeasures we can do? I mean, is there anything we can do if we don't have vaccine right away and we don't have a lot of antivirals? And so we look at these issues of how can we keep people apart, sort of this social distancing if we have the first cases here in North Carolina identified, will it help to isolate them, meaning stay at home, don't go out with other people, and observe the people exposed to that person and then put them in isolation if they develop symptoms? And I don't mean a bubble or anything. I just mean, you know, stay at home, don't go to the grocery store, don't have people over. Um, this is not going to be feasible once this thing is really going because it's just going to grow exponentially. But in the very first few cases, it might work to at least slow things down. And what we're really looking at is not trying to keep it out of our state, because I think that's next to impossible, but can we delay, you know, uh, weeks or months, because then we could get vaccine at some point. So that's really what we're looking at when we talk about these things. And one of the biggest things we talk about is mass quarantine or community-wide quarantine. So for me living in Durham, this is like when you get a half inch of snow and everything closes for a week. Um, the snow day approach is what we like to call it. And in Minnesota, I'm sure that means one thing. And in North Carolina, it's totally different. But kind of getting people to buy into that, to stay home for a period of time. How long is that going to be? Uh, ideally, you know, a wave of pan flu is six to eight weeks. Are we going to be able to tell people to stay home for that long? I don't think so. And I think the homicide rate would go up very high. So it would in my house. Um, but I think if we can kind of buy time and do it for five to 10 days and see how things are going and then reassess, that might be, uh, you know, something that's worth looking into. So those are the things that we're working on at the state level in terms of trying to model that and see about feasibility and palatability. Will people be able to do that? And then a huge issue, I think, especially for local level, so these are communities and county health departments and hospitals, is alternate care facilities. If they're busting at the seams, all of their beds are filled, 
is there a place they can divert to triage people, those that might just need IV fluids, um, might just need antibiotics that we do have, so setting up alternate care facilities. But this is a huge undertaking. You gotta have a location. Um, you have to have staff, which is gonna be a very big issue. So working on this reserve core of medical volunteers. Um, and you gotta have security, because you don't want everybody and their brother just showing up and, and wanting to be seen even for, like, can I get my stitches out today? Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, go home. So all of these issues are things we need to think about. And then supplies, um, you know, you don't wanna open a gymnasium with cots and then not have anything to offer people. And you wanna have staff there to help. So these are a lot of the things we're working on, especially within communities and hospitals. And then this is the last piece that I think is important for federal, state, and local. I think establishing these key partnerships, pandemic influenza, I've realized very quickly, is not a public health problem. It's everybody's problem. So realizing who you need to tap to do planning, to coordinate your planning with is very important. So we're really pushing that, especially at the community level, so that hospitals aren't saying, well, we're gonna open an alternate care facility on Highway 86, and the health department's like, I thought it was gonna be down on Highway 114. Bringing people together to say, how can we you know, really pull everybody all together to work towards the same goal? So the last thing I wanna do before we go to question and answer is just to talk a little bit about what I call pandemic preparedness. This cartoon is a guy yelling at his cat saying, never ever think outside the box. But I think for pan flu planning, we have to think outside the box. And so planning for things other than pandemic influenza, and mostly I'm talking about the other categories of flu we've talked about are very important. And the first is avian flu, not of the pandemic strain. And this map is showing you all the poultry farms dotted on this map in North Carolina. Avian influenza in poultry is going to be a huge problem <laughs> in North Carolina. So obviously in public health, we're kind of concerned about the farmers and the poultry workers and that thing. But you know, you mentioned avian influenza, a bunch of, bunch of veterinarians in agriculture, and boy, they just start going pale and pasty and they can't talk. So it, it really is a huge issue. I, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but we're either number one in broilers and number two in chicken something. I, we're at the top of the national list for two different types of poultry exports, so this is a major thing for our economy in our state. Um, so what we've done in public health is really um, worked with agriculture, but they also have an avian influenza response plan. So we have this pandemic influenza response plan, but we also have an avian influenza response plan. And you guys are all experts now, so you know what I'm talking about, but I still get calls all the time from reporters going, so when the chicken blah, 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 what are you going to do on the farm? And I'm like, no, no, that's somebody in another office across the street. But they've got plans in place to identify avian influenza in flocks, you know, how they test their chickens, not just when they're symptomatic, but routine testing to watch for it to come in. They have very tight regulations on birds being transported across the border. Um, they don't have live bird markets here in our state, but some of our farmers send their birds to live bird markets in the Northeast, so New York City. And so there's this concern about contamination. If they go and drop their birds off and bring a cage back that, again, has chicken poop in it, it could spread that way. So tight regulations that way. And then also um, depopulating or killing a flock if they identify a bad form of this, because this can spread from one farm to another on farm equipment or on somebody's boots or that kind of thing. So really tight biosecurity on these farms. And then the other important piece is we do want to protect the people that are working with these birds, because we, we know it's a rare event, but avian influenza can infect humans. And again, it could be very mild or it could be severe but we're working with them in terms of um, implementing CDC recommendations for vaccine, antivirals, all six boxes. Um, we'll give it to them right away, and <laughs> we'll be able to treat one person. Um, and then uh, also active surveillance or monitoring those workers that were exposed on a farm for 10 days out to see if they develop symptoms. So all of these pieces. And this is how we've done it. We've put together agriculture, Department of Agriculture has written their own plans, but we've added in this piece for the human health side of things. And it's really great because we've brought agriculture, industry, and public health to the table together. And these meetings are, are 
pretty funny, actually, but um, they're good because we're really, our mission in this task force is to make sure we're protecting the people. Um, they're already dealing with protecting the poultry, but we're trying to protect the people. And it's really insightful because, you know, the CDC think tank has all these great recommendations about wear a mask and these kind of gloves. And, and, you know, this veterinarian from uh, Wayne County raises his hand and says, you know, have you ever been in a chicken house in July in Goldsboro? You know, you can't wear this mask. You know, you're going to be wiping your eyes and sweat strips. So it's good because we're taking these recommendations and really putting them into practice and saying, well, if that won't work, then do this. So it's it's been a really good project. So just to end with the regular flu season, I think every flu season we go through is great practice for the real thing. And this is my favorite quote from one of our colleagues at CDC who says, when you've seen one flu season, you've seen one flu season. They are always different. Um, I've only been in public health three years, but talking to a lot of the, ve the veterans, it sounds like every year there's always a, a story to tell. One of the reasons is you never know when a flu season is going to come. So the reporters always call in October with the first arrival of vaccine, if it gets here on time, and they want to know what I think about the upcoming flu season. And I always say, I have no idea. You know, well, when do you think it's going to hit? I don't know. You know, if I was betting, I'd say January or February, but who knows? This year has been real mild, and our peak was actually in March, and we're still having activity now into April. So you can see from this, looking at different flu seasons by the month of when they peaked, um, some of them peaked as late as May. Not many, but some of them do. And then they can come as early as December. Um, but anyway, when you've seen one flu season, you've seen one. So you just don't know one year to the next. And two things I'm going to highlight. Um, actually, I'm just going to highlight one. I'm going to skip over the surveillance part, but just to tell you that we have surveillance during our regular flu season to really track this disease in our state that I think is going to help us during a pandemic to sort of see when it comes in, where it's peaking. If any of those countermeasures are working, then we'll, you know, double our efforts in other places. But the other thing is our, our vaccine drills year after year, as frustrating as they are, I think are great practice. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a sec. So we've had shortages, and I, I like to call them shortages and pseudo shortages, but by far the most um, memorable one in recent years was 2004, 2005, when Chiron, that company in the United Kingdom, announced that they weren't going to be supplying any of their vaccine. And I think the announcement was made on October 4th because we released the pandemic plan on October 4th, and it all happened at the same time. So um, anyway, our supply was pretty much cut in half right at the start of the flu season. And again, flu vaccine has grown in eggs. So, you know, we can't whip up a bunch more. It's not like making omelets. I mean, it's going to take many months. So we were kind of stuck with what we had and really had to get used to rationing and looking at who the target groups were. So as painful as that season was, I think it was a good... Uh, dress rehearsal for what pandemic may be like. And then we've had these other pseudo shortages when either um, the supply hasn't gotten here in time or in the case of 0304, we had a lot of children die very early on. I don't know if you remember that, but Colorado and Texas were reporting pediatric deaths in October um, and November. And in North Carolina, we had nine children die in about a week and a half, right around Christmas. And everybody just panicked and thought, I got to get flu vaccine this year. People that had never gotten flu vaccine before wanted it. So we had a pseudo shortage that year because we had such a rush on it. But again, getting used to you know, supply versus demand issues, I think, are very important. And this is just to show you that since 1980 through 2000, so over a 20-year period, we've more than quadrupled the amount of vaccine we're producing and administering. So I think this is good news, and we're moving in the right direction. And I think this number is going to continue to increase. So this is the big wrap-up. You guys have done great. Basically, what I want to leave you with is forecasting the next pandemic is really difficult. And I think these people that get on Larry King Live and Good Morning America and tell you it's coming, um, I think they just kind of want their moment. Um, I think trying to tell you when it's going to happen and how bad it's going to be is anybody's guess. And we just won't know till it's here and we're, we're starting to deal with it. Um, I think H5N1 is posing a threat because it's not going away in birds. The more chances it's in birds to infect people, the more opportunity it has to mutate, so it could happen that way. Um, 
obviously it's a very unique thing to plan for and um, you know I've learned a lot along the way but there's still a lot to be done and the biggest thing that I've learned is that a lot of different people need to plan so I think down to individuals and families for what would I need if the governor said look we're in a state of emergency try to stay home for seven days and pretend that there's a half inch of snow out there what would you need for seven days at home and you know it wasn't until I read the checklist myself for individuals that I thought oh I do need to buy cat food that's a good idea so it, it's the kind of thing that a lot of different entities need to plan businesses schools all levels of government but um, certainly that website is really good and I've, I've put it back up here too if any of you didn't get it and want to copy it down but the first one's the World Health Organization just if you want to follow along what's happening overseas with the cases and then CDC is always a great website and they break down the categories of flu very well avian human and pandemic and then that pandemicflu.gov is that screenshot i showed you of all the good resources and then finally the last one is is our website ncpublichealth.com and that's where you can find our plan and other materials as well so i'm sorry i went way over but be happy to take your questions mm -hmm.